And thanks to the Verde Centre Online for hosting us, as usual. So, as um, pretty much all of you know, I'm Shanti Garba, co-founder of, of Tree Ratna Sangha and one of the conveners and host for today, which is Earth Day. So, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce, um, I call him my friend, Teja Pala. We have a kind of uh, humorous relationship, but uh, yeah, we've, we've also worked together uh, and he helped me with my chapter on climate comedy and also the overall shape, actually, of, of my book, The Burning House. So um, Teja Pala is the presenter for this session, which runs for two hours, including a 10 minute break. So Teja Pala is from Melbourne in Australia, originally from New Zealand, um, but now living in Melbourne, Australia. He might say why um, in, in, a, in a minute. He's a member of the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order living in, uh, living in Melbourne. He spent five years in the UK. That was where I first met him. He lived in London for five years, training for ordination. And he currently works for a, a multi-faith climate, ca climate campaign organization called the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change, or ARC for short. So I'll put that in the chat. And I'll put, I, I think I'll put that on the panel already, but I'll put that in the chat for you to look. And he helped coordinate the Green Faith International Day of Action in October 2021. He also performs stand-up comedy about the climate, the, the climate and Dharma practice. So you may or may not get some of that this morning. I don't know. It depends on his mood. Really. And the title of uh, Teja Pala's session is In the Face of Climate Crisis, How Can We Have Faith? So the climate crisis is not only the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced, but possibly the biggest challenge Buddhism has faced too. Our faith in the, our confidence in the path can get badly shaken or worse. So he's going to explore how we can keep our trust and confidence in the three jewels at this time. Over to Tejapala. Welcome. Thank you, Shanti Garba. Um, hello. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, it's 6.08 p.m. for me where I am. Um, and thank you to um, the Buddhist Centre Online. Thanks to Zach for doing the tech work. Um, so I'm just hopefully going to say something of some use tonight and lead something, a workshop that people will find helpful. And these really are just my reflections um, that I'm going to be going through tonight. But first of all, we're going to have a short um, Metta Bhavana uh, practice uh, led in a particular way. Um, and I noticed someone, who was it? Someone said that she was from Shoreham, um, just to correct my bio, um, born in the UK. Um, only about an hour west of Shoreham. So, um, but grew up in New Zealand from the age of seven. Uh, so I don't know if anyone here is, people from outside of um, the UK as well. I think we have at least one person from Sydney, which is great. So I'm just going to lead the Metta Bhavana. It's going to be pretty simple Metta Bhavana for 25 minutes. And what I'm going to encourage us all to do is to reflect as we're doing the Metta Bhavana on the way in which each person in each stage is to some extent or another stuck in the samsaric cycle. Um, those of you who are familiar with the Wheel of Life reflection might want to bring that to mind, but essentially stuck in some degree of existential reactivity that keeps us coming back to states of greed and hatred and ignorance. Um, that's the fundamental problem um, as, the, as the Buddha saw it. So uh, I just, I don't want to paint too bleak a picture, but you know, people will, people will have happy aspects to their lives as well as you bring them to mind. But uh, it will tie into the talk later on, I think, if we reflect in that way a little bit. So I don't like leading all the way through like I'm some annoying DJ talking all the way through a song. So um, I'll just introduce each stage very briefly. Um, so if you just want to take your time to set up your meditation, 
as comfortably as you can sitting in front of a Zoom camera. And I trust everyone knows how to start the practice of the Metta Bhavana in a grounded way by taking a second to do absolutely nothing with your attention in particular. Just sit there for a second. You have to take your mind somewhere and just take it into your body. And see if you can connect with your heart. And all I'm going to ask you to reflect on in this metabhavana practice in the first stage is ways in which from time to time you tend to react, we all do. And see if you can connect with any wish to break free of that reactivity.
So now bring to mind a good friend. Start by connecting with your own initial emotional response to them, whatever it may be. then you might want to reflect on ways in which that person gets stuck in their own patterns of reactivity. May they be free from that. And now someone you have no particularly strong feelings about, a neutral person. May they also be free from the suffering that comes from the constant tiring process of defending and building up a sense of self.
And for the fourth stage, bring to mind someone you find difficult, perhaps even someone you find difficult when it comes to the climate crisis. Notice that whatever is propelling them through life is in very large part this delusional desire to create, build up and defend a sense of a fixed self. All the hate and all the greed or the anger that comes with that or the pride that comes with that. All the variations on those mental states. They also suffer. May they be free from that.
and in the final stage. Just extend that heart wish for happiness out to connect with all other beings' heart wish for happiness. No matter how deluded our attempts at getting that happiness may be. And when you're ready, 
Gently open your eyes. Um, I'd find it easier to connect with people if um, you turn your video on once you've come out of meditation. Um, thanks. So the next bit of this is I'm just going to give a bit of a a bit of a talk about my reflections on this question of how we keep some sense of confidence and trust in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha in the face of the climate crisis. Um, and may, some people may not re relate to that question, but it's been a part of my life for quite a while. Um, and these are just my reflections. I don't think I can have anything particularly definitive to say. Um, I've just been at this a little while. I'm sure others here have as well. Uh, so in the mid 1990s, I encountered two things at roughly the same time in my life. One was Buddhism coming across what I saw as the truth of what the Buddha was communicating. And then at very much the same time, finally got a, a proper understanding of the reality of climate change. Those two things probably happen within a year of each other. And uh, it's sort of shaped my life ever since. Um, there's been other things as well, but those two things have had a huge effect. Uh, along the way, and uh, both before and after ordination, I have at times quite seriously questioned the relevance of Buddhism. Um, I think it took a long time to, to really distill as a question. Um, but essentially it came down to whether what the Buddha had to say was really was a path out of suffering, of the kind of suffering that we've got from climate change or what that we are having and are threatened with climate change. Um, just to recap the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha was fundamentally concerned with the question of suffering. Um, you know, he, he saw suffering, he saw the cause of suffering in the sense of the building up of a fixed sense of self, the, the constant delusion of a sense of self that's separate that we've just been reflecting on in the Metabhavana. And he was um, concerned with a way that, that the cessation of that suffering and the, and the path that led to the cessation of that suffering. Um, and that worked. I mean, there's no doubt, I actually don't have any doubt that that what the Buddha taught works. Um, it, it's just that when the Buddha was alive, there was never a problem of this kind that we now face that threatens all of life in a way that will threaten it pervasively uh, in the very long term. It was incredibly urgent. Uh, that kind of problem didn't exist. Uh, and it's occurred to me many times, well, it would be lovely if our answer to uh, if our answer to the suffering that comes from climate change was simply to communicate the Dharma more and more um, broadly. But you know, we as most as everyone here, I'm sure, is aware, we we just don't have the time for that to be our to such a for such a simple answer. Um, I was taken by one thing in Shantigarbha's book, The Burning House. Um, I think Shantigarbha, you asked whether or not um, the, or even maybe you asserted it, I'm not sure, whether or not the suffering from, um, from the climate crisis could be regarded as a, a fifth site in addition to the other four sites of you know, old age, sickness and death and, um, and, the, and the wise man. So... You know, in other words, is it a whole new class of suffering? I think I think that's what that question is asking. Um, certainly, that's the way I took it. Uh, and that 
that question has unfortunately at times been compounded by some of the responses of some of my fellow Buddhists. Um, I don't want to annoy or stimulate any anger here, but I have heard a number of things that have left me at times feeling frustrated or angry or demoralized. Um, maybe it'd be quite, quite interesting to see, to know, you know, you, you may have heard some variations on, on some of these responses from fellow true around the Buddhists, things like, yes, that activism is all very well, but it's got nothing to do with the Dharma. Um, the Buddha wasn't a social worker. Um, or I'm glad someone's doing that, good on you, but we don't all have to do that, do we? Um, I'm very concerned, that's why I recycle. Um, I do my bit. Uh, very occasionally you get, I don't think the climate is changing anyway. Um, I have to say that is a vanishingly small group of order members and I deal with people from lots of different religious traditions for a living and we are blessedly almost entirely free of that by comparison with almost everybody. Um, I know that climate change is a real threat, but let's face it, everything is impermanent, including human civilization. So in the meantime, I just want to practice the Dharma as if human survival and concern for human beings was separate from practicing the Dharma. Um, I agree that it's a problem, but my way of changing the world is spreading the Dharma, again, as if those two things were separate, but also ignoring the urgency of the situation. Um, this is one I've had. Uh, that's good work, but the Eco Dharma group is not core centre business, so you can't promote its activities through centre emails, the notice board, or on the face on a, on a centre Facebook page. Uh, yes, I see a nodding head there from Melissa. <laughs> um, um, and this one, after confessing anger in a chapter meeting, well, since this climate stuff is obviously making you angry, why don't you just do something else for a living? Um, uh, sort of been there and done the whole, collected the whole set. Um, you have my deepest genuine sympathies if you've ever heard any of those. Mm. And the problem that all of that creates is that it can undermine a certain kind of confidence in the Dharma. And that can lead you in a pretty bad state over time. It may be that, that on one level you do have confidence in it and on another level you, you sort of wonder if you do. And the state that it can leave you with ultimately is just not making that much progress on the path. Um, it can leave one angry at the climate crisis. It's certainly been my experience of being angry at times. Um, I think there have been particular moments when I've met with uh, senior politicians or um, business people um, that have left me wildly angry. Um, I think the angriest I've ever been was probably meeting the executive team of a company in Australia called Adani that really, really, really left me quite wild and I felt like I'd succeeded as an activist but utterly failed as an order member in that meeting. It was a very awful, it was a, a quite a, a horrible feeling. And it sometimes leaves you feeling a bit lonely in the Sangha or has at times for me. Now, um, I should add that I've never, ever seriously considered, however, walking away from Tri Ratna, walking away from the Dharma, because there's so much that is positive, so much that is positive. And I actually remain convinced that the reality that the Buddha saw is the deepest truth and it is what liberates us from suffering. Uh, there's been many things that's boosted my confidence and given me, um, really boosted my morale. Um, some of you will be very familiar with this, um, something that Bante said on uh, West, the WBO Day, Western Buddhist Order Day in 1988. Um, uh, Shantigar, I think you were the one who made sure it ended up on our Facebook page, and thank you. Um, but I think it's really worth repeating this one um, because I think it's the, most, the clearest affirmation of, of what we're doing here that I know of. He said... Sorry, I find this really moving, thinking that, thinking that Bensi said these things. He said, I think as a movement, especially as an order, we need, to take a, we need to take a much stronger stand on issues of this sort, perhaps play a more active part in, at least in our individual capacities, in the environmental movement. After all, this is completely in accordance with the principles of Buddhism. In the course of the next 20 years, and bearing in mind he said this in 1988, I would like to see our movement, I would like to see our order developing what I describe as a sort of ecological dimension. I would like to see some order members taking up this particular interest and working in this particular field from the basis of their Buddhist commitment, working perhaps even in some cases along with non-Buddhists who share this sort of concern, this sort of commitment, because it is something of very 
very basic importance. Now, I don't think it gets much clearer than that. Uh, one other thing I found personally very um, affirming was uh, back in 2017, I met with, um, I ended up writing an article, um, a column for they got printed in The Guardian by pure fluke um, because i have been part of a multi-faith delegation that had met with a, um, a government minister here and we'd uh, said, well, if the Adani coal mine goes ahead, we'll be prepared to get arrested over this. And so at that stage, the media here was quite interested in people they perceived as religious leaders saying that. So I, I drafted something and it went out in my name and in the name of a rabbi friend of mine and I sent a copy of that um, to Bensi, um, to, and was delighted the next day when I got a response from Mahamati, who's, who wrote a very short email saying, um, this is just to let you know that this morning I was able to read your article to Bensi, which he found informative and inspiring. Bensi trusts that you are flourishing in Australia. Now, Yeah, I mean, wow, the idea that he found something I did inspiring. I don't know where to begin with that. Um, but it certainly felt like I thought he was telling me I was doing the right thing with my life, which I definitely doubted at times. And I've been very much inspired by the existence of people all over the world, people like, like everyone here, um, especially over the past few years. I think concern about the climate has really risen within Tree Ratna. It's really risen around the world generally. We're certainly now mainstream. I can't think of an addition, anything similar to this more than, say, a, even a year ago, Shantigawa wasn't the case. We're officially mainstream Tree Ratna now. Um, we were not always thus. Yet even these things are not, were not really enough to fully address my deepest concern that perhaps Buddhism wasn't really capable of addressing this problem, not fundamentally. Is it really a path out of, out of this form of suffering? Mm. Um, you may be familiar with, with the, um, the book, What is the Sangha? And in it, in the second to last chapter, Sangha Rechter Bente asks, uh, says that his response to human suffering is to is to um, build up the Sangha, communities of, of true individuals, um, to the point, because he said in things in the long term, human survival will depend on spiritual communities, out, the, the influence of spiritual communities, plural, outweighing the influence of the group. I happen to think that is an absolute stroke of genius and he's exactly right. I also happen to think we don't have the time for that with the climate crisis. And so I was left with a real tension there. Um, however, I think what I've decided is that um, whatever role Dharma practice may play in addressing the climate crisis, um, we certainly need it. First of all, we need it because we need the Dharma. I mean, human beings need the Dharma. And I'll come back to that in a second. But, I mean, we certainly need it in order to address our own suffering. If that's all that happens in the face of whatever comes our way in the next few decades, boy, do we need it. Um, uh, we need to, um, and I also think it can benefit the climate movement. Um, one thing the Buddhist tradition is completely uncompromising about is the centrality of the mind. Um, and I think this is something that is barely noticed by the wider world and probably particularly by activists. Um, I don't know how many activists you've met, but not all of them I've known have always been that aware of their own minds. Uh, you must be familiar with the first two verses of the Dhammapada where the Buddha says, experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind and produced by mind. If one speaks or acts, with an impure mind, suffering follows even as the cartwheel follows the hoof of the ox drawing the cart. Experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind and produced by mind. If one speaks or acts with a pure mind, happiness follows like a shadow that never departs. In other words, your mental states are pivotal, utterly pivotal, and they really matter. If we want positive consequences in the world, we need positive states of mind. If we want the climate 
movement to have positive consequences in the world. To some extent, we need to be, we need to be able to be aware of the states of mind that we're speaking and acting out of uh, to quite an extent. We need to be acting and speaking out of compassion and not horrified anxiety. Um, we, need to be, we need to have a strong sense of confidence and trust in the Dharma. Um, uh, Sabuti makes the excellent point in um, Mind and Harmony that the mental state of Shraddha accompanies all of the other 10 positive mental events. Uh, in other words, and he basically says, in other words, without confidence in something higher, and it doesn't have to be in the three, the three jewels, but confidence in something higher than oneself, um, all the other mental positives, mental states are not possible. Quite a thought. We certainly need um, skillful speech in the climate movement. It's really hard to speak skillfully about the climate, I think, to speak really, really truthfully about it and kindly. That's not always easy. Just those two speech precepts, and there's two others. Um, not getting into righteous indignation. I mean, I work with people from across different faith traditions, and you know, most of them think there's such a thing as, as righteous indignation, and that you should just go for it. Um, Buddhism is quite the Buddha was quite um, categorical about saying, well, what we call ethics is what is what comes from kind or unkind states of mind, aware or unaware states of mind. Uh, and there's no such thing as justified anger or hate when you when if you see ethics that way, there just isn't. And so much activism founders on that rock, um, and just being able to communicate that in some way to, our, to others in the climate movement, boy, is that needed. We also need, I think, a vision of what human beings can be at our best, um, and something of the bodhisattva spirit in our activism. Um, we need practices that help us move towards that vision and we need other people to do that with. And uh, by we, I don't just mean we Buddhists. I really think that's what, that's what the, the, the climate movement is mostly in need of, and not mostly, but certainly in need of. Also, <laughs> I might say, what's the point of the, of, of the Dharma in the face of the climate crisis? But actually there are other crises that could destroy us too. Um, on March the 4th, the Russian army got remarkably close um, to a nuclear reactor in Chernobyl, um, it's actually shelling it. Um, we really could have started a nuclear war if you ever wanted a reminder of that. And hey, the last couple of years has taught us that disease is not exactly out of the question. Um, I happen to think that really good government policy is really essential, um, but People who are really driven by greed, hatred, and ignorance, if they want to, can find a way around any government policy as well. Um, technology makes all sorts of things possible. So we will still need, to some extent, a world in which we work on our states of mind. We need a worldwide culture of awareness of the mind, at least to have some of that in the mix. Um, and that will mean Sangha. We also just don't know what's going to happen with the climate crisis. We don't know how bad it's going to get. But even under the really bad scenarios, probably particularly under the really bad scenarios, we're going to need Dhamma practice. The world is going to need that. The world's going to need the Sangha. Under all. So I don't think, I can't think through a scenario in which I think, no, that's not helpful. Um, so I've actually decided that we need Dhamma practice now more than ever, but I'm also convinced that um, we Buddhists need to be active in the climate movement. Uh, I've learned from my job that our voice and our presence can be compelling. Uh, small numbers of people who are formally religious of any kind turning up at well thought through actions, being visible as Buddhists for in our case, can be really compelling. Um, we have the advantage that we can teach meditation or lead meditation act, um, activist uh, actions and that others who wouldn't identify with any other faith tradition might want to join in. Um, so, and 
a group of people sitting in meditation posture, it achieves two things. It might introduce some things to meditation, some people to meditation, and it creates a compelling image of what we are trying to contrast ecological destruction with. Uh, I have to admit that I'm often so busy with my own activism that I often have little time to for helping the sangha directly um, and or, or to communicate how one should work with one's own mind. And I find that painful that that lack of time for that. It's a weird division in my life. Um, so I think that I need to find ways of doing both. It's hence my interest in this. Um, we, I think we need to find ways of doing both at the same time. And by both, I mean changing the world and very quickly and working with our states of mind and doing so with friends. Um, and so that's the challenge, as I see before us, isn't so much, you know, do we or don't we or do I or don't I have confidence in the three jewels? But my, the question I think that should be is, how do we cultivate a sangha that works passionately on addressing this crisis? and simultaneously practices and communicates the vision and the practices that the Dharma, that the Buddha taught. Bente's vision, our system of practice and friendship. We need to be able to do both well. I have a few suggestions about how we might go about doing that. And I will go and finish with a word of caution or warning for, for trying, for when we get into that world of trying to do that. No doubt others have talked about this. I have missed some of the other sessions that have happened. Um, I understand there were people talking about exactly this recently on this retreat. Um, but some of my suggestions include um, offering to teach meditation to activists, um, deliberately reaching out to activist organisations or movements, whether that's Extinction Rebellion or whether that's a much more organised and um, well-heeled climate organisation. I don't think it matters too much. We've got a bunch of people who are pretty stressed out um, and in need of some Karen Bhavana, honestly. Um, uh, even harder, but, but I think definitely needed, is finding ways of not just communicating um, meditation to um, people in the climate movement, but the undiluted Dharma in all its fullness and depth. Um, and, you know, that's not always... Easy. It may not always be the thing that people want to talk about, but um, I, there is a surprising degree of interest sometimes, and I, where that interest is there, I think we should follow up. I think we should take actions together as a sangha. I think I've seen people do that. It's really inspired me. I haven't seen a lot of it on this side of the world. I've done a little bit of it uh, on this side of the world, um, but it's really lovely when I, especially when I see, I've seen a number of actions in the UK outside of Barclays Bank, it's the usual one, um, and it's great to see. It's really good to see. The only thing I would add is when we do an action, I think we need to be working with an organisation that's got a very clear strategy so that we know that our tactic is going to add up to something. So it's worth getting in contact. I think um, we, we need in and the Sangha to, uh, and if in each country, I think we should be trying to reach out to organi organizations that will be best fitted to work with uh, the Tree Ratna movement. In the UK, there happens to be a group called Faith for the Climate, which does multi faith, um, well, works with a number, it's an umbrella group really for a number of multi faith climate active um, organizations. In the United States, there's Green Faith. In Australia, there's the organisation I work for, the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change. There may be others. There's obviously Extinction Rebellion. Uh, just I think we need to be working out, you know, who's got a really clear strategy, in other words, a really clear pathway that if you do X and Y and Z, it will add up to the change that we want, at least to some extent. And then how do we as Buddhists best work with those people? So if we do have meditation actions or whatever we do together, that energy is well used. So those are my suggestions. Um, yes, I can put some links later on. Thanks for that, Suzanne. Oh, oh, Shand um, oh Shandy Gav is putting some links in there. I just want to finish with one word of caution, which is um, what I've been talking about could be summed up as 
finding ways to engage with the world and in, in other words kind of a horizontal practice Bante made the often made the distinction between horizontal and vertical practices vertical dimensions to our practice uh, there is a danger i think especially when something that keeps you as busy as climate activism that we could get caught almost entirely in a in a horizontal um mode and in other words that we could lose a sense of of, of the vertical uh, and i've seen that happen there's a church here in australia called the uniting church and they're they're a really lovely bunch of people and they kind of do everything for refugees and the climate and aboriginal rights and i really respect that but I just get the sense that they're just that, that's 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 what they think. It all comes down to on its own level, and I just don't get any sense of anything higher that inspires and guides that for them. And I, and I, it worries me that that you know I don't want to I don't want to be part of of in, of asking people to get involved in something which ends up flattening out the vertical dimension in our practice. So one way of of um, avoiding that pitfall, I think, is seeing all of our activism as an offering. Uh, I One of the practices I do, uh, not often enough, but I do it, is the Green Tara Sadhana. And in the version that um, Bante was taught by Chedo Sangya Dorje, there's a whole process of offering the traditional offerings um, up to the eight great bodhisattvas. And then there are blessings that come from that. And then you radiate out as Tara, all of those blessings out to all beings. And I think there has to be something of that spirit in what we do. Can we have the, the just rather than say, I am trying to do this for beings. Yes, we are. But first of all, can we just offer our action to the Buddha? And then if there's a blessing that comes from that, let that go to all beings. I think if we keep that spirit in what we do, uh, then we can't go too far wrong. So um, that's it. I hope some of that was helpful. Um, so I hope that was a helpful discussion. Uh, I just wondered, we've got kind of just under 20 minutes to have a bit of a chat about what came up if, in, the, in those conversations. So pretty much open now. Um, just curious, anyone can jump in. Zoe has her hand up. Oh, I think people should just jump in rather than... Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. It actually inspired one of the things someone said was uh, how excited they'd be for uh, Earth Sangha to do some sort of action together, which, <laughs> which we, we found really exciting. Um, what else came up? I, I, and I really appreciate you highlighting the horizontal and the vertical. Um, it's very easy on actions, in my experience, to get on the horizontal quite quickly. And um, it's just really helpful to have that clearly articulated to just keep in mind the vertical. Um, as an image, it's quite helpful as well. So thank you for that. Well, the person who put that thought into my mind so explicitly was actually Jnana Vacha. Um, so for those of you who know Jnana Vacha, um, in 2016, I was lucky enough to be able to give a talk at the Order Convention in the UK, the International Order Convention on the climate. And I just kind of had a, a minute or something to talk with Jnana Vacha at one point while I was there. And he just said, look, my only concern is that 
we can lose sight of of something really really precious to lose sight of the vertical dimension and i i kind of thought at the time yes fair enough but that's not a reason not to do anything um uh, and i'm not sure whether he was saying we shouldn't do anything but i wondered if he was um so i think that's a that 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 just pushed planted a seed in my mind Uh, Shanti Garb has put in the chat. Are you okay for me to put these three questions on the Padlet? Yes, please do. I found it very moving what you said in your talk that, and um, I found you you were bringing together all sorts of different directions that are all valid. You know, it's. Um, um, you know, that sense of really being aware what we can do and having that wise attitude or openness that we can't run around and just make the world how we want it to be. You know, it's both at the same time really going for it. Um, but also, you know, I can't take my sangha and just push it in one direction. I, I can, I can just offer something uh, into that whole process, and like here, connect with others who find these things important and strengthen each other together. Um, and the the vertical dimension for me has also that taste of um, kind of connecting me with with something wider than i can than, than i can do but i'm part of it i don't know if that you know it's not so easy to say that in english um mm -hmm. if I, if i would feel limited to myself it, it wouldn't work but at the same time it's very important what i do as alissa as a human being with my deeds and actions and to be widened and and bend in that sense of those different directions to me has a sense of that it's bigger and more meaningful than just sticking to one idea this you know either only relating to direct action or just having a great vision but only sitting on the meditation cushion that the combination is uh, brings about a really amazing energy i find Hmm. Good to hear it. Yeah. Anything that people found difficult or challenging, and so you know, I I just like to completely agree with um, Alicia. I mean, I think your question of you know, how do we um, develop a sort of uh, Buddhist, you know, bodhisattva practitioners, and how we do we get actually involved and be effective in the climate movement really really important and i think there's a missing vocabulary of a synthesis between both um and this is you know we don't want to sit on the meditation cushion and do nothing at the same time we don't want to get involved in the unwitting unviolence and aggression of being anti-capitalist and it's how we pull those two um ways of being together um that work for both i love what you said about what Buddhism can bring to the climate movement, you know, mindfulness, awareness, and that whole vocabulary of, of pulling together and making connections between both is very, very missing for me. You know, I keep looking for it. And I thought what you were saying was one of the closest I've ever heard um, about what the spaces we need to open up are between both, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a responsibility for for those of us who have done a bit of both for a while, um, possibly particularly order members who've done a bit of both for a while, to to get together and talk and to, to talk about it because um, so that we can kind of you know to some extent be more helpful um, mm. because you know it's a work in progress. But some people have been at it for in both dharma practice and and climate activism for for longer and um and i just think well we we need to we've got there's a responsibility for us to work together i haven't yet it hasn't yet happened but you know the three earth sangha conveners we haven't yet had an 
uh, to my knowledge, maybe I've missed it because I've been on the other side of the world, um, a, a sort of an order only gathering. Uh, and I think it would be really interesting if we did that. I'm not sure that we want to keep it that, but I think it would be very interesting as a starting point. Um, maybe, maybe also order Mitra at some point. But uh, yeah, I mean, just developing that that vocabulary, that understanding of how these things connect, what the pitfalls are. Um. I'd just like to speak to that, Andy. I've just been in open rebellion on the streets, and I can tell you that the non-Buddhist activists that um, stimulate thousands of people on the street have a very um clear message and a great oversight they've been doing it for a long time and depending on who you go with i mean my only connection with xr was their fundamental basis is non-violence and that comes in with everything they do so it's not about sort of crushing or uh there's no blaming no shaming and that is uh, written in their rules, we do not blame, we do not shame, they're, they're, and that allows the leveling for us to be able to make those changes. So it's definitely embedded deeply. Um, there's, I, I realize there are uh, um, uh, other groups who do things different ways, but there are definitely um, uh, a lot of people who understand that sort of really the fundamentals of Buddhism do allow them to uh, make changes. And that's based on history again, you know, of, of Gandhi and they often refer to Gandhi, they refer to Martin Luther King, this constant sort of movement, the suffragettes of just non-violence uh, being vital for that level of dialogue to be possible. To what extent, because I've not been involved in XR, but to what extent in, in the XR circles that you've been in, um, Zoe and others um, has that um, that nonviolence that ethos also included what I think is nat a natural concomitant of that, which is an uh, an awareness of your mind. Yes, I'd, I'd like to address that. So I'm part of a local XR group, and I'm also part of the Action Wellbeing team, where we we have got a network of how to support XR activists in in actions and mm -hmm. an integral part of what we're doing is we start every every action every meeting every, as with a meditation be it only three minutes a meditation where we come together we check in with how we are and we make sure that there's a buddhist uh, not a buddhist there is an intention of why we're doing this a bigger picture thing and that's is done at the beginning of any action or meeting and at the end, which I'm sort of being inspired from my Buddhist practice. And I was scared of integrating it or proposing it even, and it's just been accepted so well. Um, I'm really impressed. Um, and, and I noticed Shanta Chitta has just put something about XR Buddhists on in the chat. Um, gosh, I wish we had XR Buddhists in, in Australia. If someone would care to come over here and start it up, I'm too busy doing other things. <laughs> um, but gosh, I, I see the words XR Buddhist, I just feel so much, I don't know, I don't begin to feel moody. I just feel envy um, that, that such a world exists. Um, but yes, I'm glad that that is, that is done, that there's a reflection there, there's some time at the beginning. I mean, I wish it would be interesting, by the way, in any Dharma, eco dharma groups that you are part of in your locations to just you know as part of what you do if you know one part of it being action based and another part being kind of just reflecting on the states of mind that you were in during those actions um and perhaps even a confession element i'm, I'm a big believer in traditional buddhist um thanks abai netri thanks for coming um in traditional buddhist confession um so I just think, like, let's keep that alive as well. But also, I've also heard of other people who've done a really good job. Shanti Gabar, I heard you talk recently about an action that you did outside of, I think it was Barclays Bank, where you brought mindfulness into every aspect of that action. So it doesn't have to be just something you do before and afterwards. 
Sure. Well, um, the kind of model for actions that I've got from actually being part of XR Buddhist is from Joe Mission, who has been doing it for quite a few years. <clears throat> previously with dance, which is like Dharma Action Network or something like that. Um, and yeah, no, it's very meditative, very ritualized. And if we if we want a model for sort of Tree Ratna Earth Sangha actions, you know, I, I recommend we explore that, that kind of model of quite a ritualized uh, meditative uh, action in silence, you know, walking in silence and leaving in silence and doing a debrief somewhere else and so forth. And that does create a degree of like sense of safety and sense of kind of uh, significance really to it that, 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 that I find particularly useful. So we've got, you know, we, you know, we've got ideas about how to do that. And I know looking on the screen, I can see a few people from XR, I know from XR Buddhists as well. So um, yeah, we've got some ideas about that. That's really, really encouraging. Christine, I can see your hand up. Yeah, what, one thing that um, somebody was mentioning about never feeling worried about doing a silent vigil. Um, but what, one of the things I've experienced doing vigils on the steps of the Welsh Parliament was we had, it was an interfaith vigil with XR there, um, but we had somebody who was a mediator between the group and the public or the police, whoever was there. And that was really helpful. So I just wanted to offer that as a as an additional option. I think it was a Cooper who was saying he'd never been worried, but certainly I feel a lot safer if there's a mediator there with his, with a, their eyes open to, mm. to deal with any any uh, passers by. Yeah, well, I can comment on that. Before I was with Exile Buddhist, I was doing non-violence in de-escalation. De so wearing one of those white um, vests, uh, XR vests. So um, that's also, a, if, if you have those skills or you have that kind of wish to, you know, sort of to regulate the temperature so we don't slide into, non, uh, into violence, then, then, then that's a very, a very, very effective way of contributing. Yeah. I guess I'm really encouraged by the fact that I'm talking now with 23 other people who, some of whom seem to be interested in, in that kind of Buddhist practice of uh, activist Buddhism or Buddhist activism. Um, I would just want to throw in a, a plant an idea, which is that um, Green Faith International is probably going to have another, some kind of day or some other event of, that's going to be around the world, um, probably just prior to COP27 towards the end of this year. Um, whether it's that or whether it's um, another campaign that's just someone's, well, I think it's really useful, as I said earlier on, to find a, um, a, a campaign or an action which with a clear strategy behind it that's got half a chance of making a difference. And then us, as many of us as together as possible across lots of different centres doing similar enough actions as part of something like that. I don't think it, I mean, I'm mentioning Green Faith International because it's one I know about, but I just think we need, to, if we can have something with some cohesion and with, uh, and with some shared strategy, then I think those two things, that powerful non-violent Buddhist action, then it really does go somewhere. Yeah, can I just say uh, one of my challenges I find when out on action is looking around wondering, where is Greenpeace? Where are Friends of the Earth? Where are all these people? Because I know that there are people working 60, 80 hour weeks to set up campaigns all at different times of the year in different places around different things. And I just... I worry that people are burning out when we could support each other more if there was just some cohesion, if people were willing to step away from whatever their brand is into something bigger. And to be fair, to some extent in some locations, that is the case. In Australia, right at the moment, um, there's an enormous level of cooperation across almost all climate organisations on, on a shared strategy, and we're four weeks out from a federal election. So um, that... Whether it works, who knows? But um, but definitely that does happen uh, at times. 
Any other responses to the questions I put out there? Because we've only got a couple more minutes before we're going to wind up. Could I just share something I wrote down, uh, both from your talk, and thank you for that, but also from the comments from the group I was in. And it was almost shocking. I wrote down that I feel lonely in my own sangha in relation to the climate and ecological emergency. Yeah. And feeling lonely in your own sangha is quite shocking. I realised that coming out of that, I ought to do something about it. Thank you. Hey, hey, look, where are you? Where in the, where you're in, it looks like you say Essex. Yeah, you Essex, yeah. Uh, I'm part of the mid-Essex Goodest Centre. Last time I knew that wasn't a particularly big centre, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, growing. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's um, useful to stay in touch with, with others um, like this um, as a starting point. And also, do you know even just one other person who feels similarly or not? Yeah, there is uh, another person. And there's also a, a, a group of people that do meet under the heading of Transforming Self and World, and that would be a sensible place to find one or two other people. Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, much as... It, it can be possible to keep a sense of, the, of a confidence in this particular version of the Buddhist path alive on your own. It's really hard. Um, so, you know, do, you know, do find other people if you can as a starting point. I think we were probably about to, I, I think I left five minutes at the end for you, Shantigarbha, to, to wind us up. I think it was going to be you. So I want to thank Tejapala for his uh, inspiring thoughts and ideas and suggestions and reflections and experiences, uh, having been involved in this area for quite a while, quite a while. Is it more than 20 years, Tejapala? It's kind of on and off. It's on started and off. off as um, very heavily involved as an activist, and then I spent a long time doing yeah. conventional household energy efficiency and other sustainable okay. stuff, sustainability stuff and then i came back to to the activism so it depends how you count it but yes um, since the mid 90s in one form or another yeah and i remember supporting tejapala quite a few years ago on an order convention and he was doing some kind of forum i can't remember i think i was sick but um i remember so he was a bit of a lone voice in the wilderness a few quite a few years ago so uh, i'm glad that he's got a home now in the order. And, Thank you. I'm glad I've got one too. <laughs> oh, right. And you've got another one as well in Melbourne as well, but a kind of spiritual. Though. I mean, I know what you mean. And he's very, he um, really appreciate his uh, input and uh, kind of guidance of the Tree Ratna Sangha, particularly in the initially, initially in setting it up. And um, yeah, and I hope that he'll, he'll stay connected and, you know, stay involved with, with the planning as we go forward. So I think that's it. So maybe just a kind of collective kind of celebration of Tejapala and what he's been doing for the last however many years.